with this we request mr doctor to please take the session forward good evening this is the last session of the today's program but uh, i think it is a very important session we are here none of our panelists is going to give any presentation but uh, this session will be conducted by me through the question answers and what are the feeling whatever you want to know the opportunities ahead of us for the automation and artificial intelligence whatever i know about it i we are now backdated but we have gone through with my age what i can tell you we have seen uh, seen the changes changes uh, which is uh, probably we are the luckiest we always thought uh, in terms of uh, seeing the changes in the what is happening in the world especially in the electronics communication now as you know that artificial intelligence uh, is a vast subject and uh, it is uh, not very easy to uh, cover it the total gambit of it in a one session but uh, it is the use of it the amount of benefits the society is going to get amount of uh, benefit the individual is going to get through this is phenomenal i have seen uh, one presentation uh, given by kosturi about a month back kosturi about a month back uh, i will uh, i can tell you that uh, that is uh, quite uh, quite quite a quite a bit is uh, it is uh, sometime it appears uh, to be scary the what is going to happen to the human race uh, are we are really able to cope up with the development which is coming up whether we have any uh, ut utility at all if the machine is doing everything uh, it is something i will uh, uh, tell kasturi to give a just a uh, request kasturi to just give a glimpse of it what is happening in the world then leave it to uh, one by one they can talk about it a little bit then i leave it for the question answers please go story thank you mr dotto i am my co presenters so today i don't have a presentation and um, uh, sometimes uh, we say that uh, a picture be uh, speaks a thousand words i wish i did have it but maybe we'll have another occasion where i can present it um being a technology practitioner i am going to address it more from the technology perspective in terms of what's happening uh where uh, we talk about automation um taking over first while jobs or even functions not even jobs even functions like thinking uh are being taken over by pieces of equipment and um artificial intelligence so some of the critical things and today throughout the sessions we've heard quite a bit about uh, buzzwords such as iot and clouds and big data and analytics um so what what is it essentially essentially um uh, what technology is doing is basically when we had the first shift in um industrial automation it was all about building system aids for instance building erp or crms where certain functions which were getting too complex for human brain to keep track of monitor or calculate were being taken over by the software industry now today the function itself the physical functions the mechanical functions of say an assembly plant or operating in a during a surgery for a patient or um things like uh transportation and we heard uh, Sean Joy speak a lot about that interesting those are now being taken over uh by bots robots cobots there are so many words around it basically it is actually a merger of uh, a mechanical function 
aided with an intelligence which is a computer that is being pushed into into that external part and uh, it is probably it is it has already proliferated in a, in a lot of instances especially the manufacturing segment um, and in in areas where uh, again it is cumbersome or uh, cost are not cost effective in those kinds of areas but let me address uh, since the session name is how do we uh, convert challenges into opportunity let me talk about few things where it has actually um, worked and will work in the future there is a concept called augmented reality or virtual reality now what is augmented reality or virtual reality basically when um, yourself when there is a device you're wearing and uh, you're sitting uh, in a chair like this and you're transported into an environment where you can almost touch and feel what is happening around you not going into uh, where we can do shopping uh, on the shelves uh, from a virtual reality perspective but in real life where there is a lot of industrial maintenance and in in cases where the safety factor like in mines or in offshore drilling this concept of maintenance is being handled by augmented or virtual reality which is really really coming into use even if there is a fire that is being that that happens in a remote oil field it is possible to put out by put out that fire remotely sitting from an office uh technologically very much possible because all you are doing is you're looking at a computer screen um the computer is able to take commands uh from you as a human and you are commanding a device which could be a remote fire extinguisher which has a chipset embedded in it and the chipset is able to take the directions because all it is is a computer logic so sometimes you know what we find fantastical or you know like a fantasy world is actually very very much possible now while i spoke about an instance where it is really um, you know in a such a hazardous situation it comes to human use uh, and our use where we don't have to physically send somebody into a dangerous assignment and can actually kind of remotely control that environment which can uh, go out of control similarly there are instances where um large and and we ourselves i come from ericsson we are we ourselves are engaged in a lot of these kinds of projects where you know there are bush fires that happens in australia and there are large expanses and it is very much possible to be able to monitor like from a knock that we monitor telecom systems it is very much possible through iot to be able to monitor these kinds of environments where it is not physically possible to send human on rounds to do that and prevent such ma large scale hazards and bush fires so in lot of instances while this um this is where we are going but in other instances the possibilities are where a company is looking at their bottom line and wanting to make margins and profits this this technology itself is being used uh for automating industrial processes where there is a possibility of people not being used in those scenarios okay thank you thank you gosuri uh, uh i i can add whatever she has said so far like your uh, in surgery in medical science is going really really fast and this automation uh, specifically use of robots uh, in uh, operations is now very very common even even uh, today uh, this is uh, in calcutta it is happening i can tell you uh, the brain surgery brain tumor removal can be done uh, through your veins Uh, and it is uh, really like she said it is uh, you just uh, look at the send of your uh, some camera inside no and uh, look at it in the screen and operate it it is a way have you have a, uh, the people are doing it here there are surgeons specialist on this uh, what about can be done on heart same thing can be done on the brain this is an uh, is 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 a basic, basically a nothing but your uh, uh, automation Uh, this is uh, what is happening 
I uh, now uh, request Sindrani to talk about your experience and what you think about it. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, from the morning, we have been hearing a great deal. In fact, nothing else but automation. But the other word which is there in today's conclave, society, I think that's where I come in. Uh, I'm from Mumbai, but it's personally very gratifying to come to the city where I was born and raised, Kolkata. Uh, to me, this whole discussion that we've been having, I bring to you the perspective of working with the government as the civil society partner to find solutions to problems that exist in our society and such solutions which are sustainable. So when we talk about automation today, two of Government India's campaign, a program and a campaign, comes to mind and that is Digital India, which is the program and which focuses on infrastructure, on governance and on digital empowerment of citizens. The other is the Accessible India campaign. And to this, why I am sharing, because it was our privilege to have Bengal Chamber to be our collaborator when we launched in support of Accessible India campaign to make IT accessible. We can make IT accessible, which was in 2015. Now, when we talk about accessibility, which is digital accessibility, we should not only be looking at the technical aspect which we have just been hearing throughout the day, but how do common citizens, today I bring to you, the, you know, the, the perspective of an average citizen, because each one of us, no matter what your profession is, end of the day we are all citizens, and each one of us have certain challenges in using the digital medium, the digital processes, the online processes of the government and how it affects us in our daily lives. In the morning, Dr. Gupta had mentioned about various technical aspects, but may I please indulge Mr. Dotto to take a moment to share what we did in Mumbai. After all, Mumbai is the financial capital and to a great extent, many things do happen over there which takes on the trend. Uh, in 2014, as part of my work and seeing the way it is with the government, in two, two decades that I've been associated in civil society work, I am formerly from the corporate sector, so I'm very mindful of how the corporate sector works and what are the challenges and what drives the corporate sector. But coming into the voluntary work to work with the government, Naturally, we look to how the larger section of society and how the demographic and in the Indian context, the online processes affect each one of us. So we launched a web portal which actually brought to the fore the easy access and a one-stop shop of all the questions that are raised by the citizens while dealing with the various aspects of the government services. Thereafter, we also launched a live talk show. Why I am sharing this is that soon after that, um, since we work with the government and in the spirit of partnership, my government.in, which all of you are familiar with, came into existence. And in Maharashtra, what was launched is called Aple Sarkar, which is Amade Sarkar. Now, through that, all government services becomes available to the citizens. But what happened with it? Now, when we have the online processes, we often talk about, when we talk about accessibility, we often, we will think immediately of those people or citizens who are challenged or who have disabilities. But a big section we don't look at is where we need assistive technology. So the user experience journey, the difficulties or the ease with which you use the government online processes is highly important and which needs a great focus. No doubt, all automotive services and processes 
will come into play and is already in the process. But when we are looking at our subject matter of today's conclave, of the bridge, we have to see where the human reality check is required. And whereas automation is here to stay, and there's nothing wrong with it, because I have used technology to work, and I think, Mr. Chatterjee, you and I will have a great deal to talk with, Mr. Shonjoy Chatterjee, because transport, road safety are very much part of my work. And the first time a project on transport of our precious cargo of school children was launched by me in, with the traffic police of Mumbai in, in uh, uh, 2002. And how technology was used to augment that into a government policy in 2011. But there are many such issues. But I think what I would like to request is that each one of us look at what the online services, the government processes, how it affects us, and where we need to intervene. As a Chamber of Commerce and Industry, whenever each one of the members of the Chamber looks to automation, looks to improve their product and uh, processes, it should also take into account how it can augment and assist the government and think of the common citizen, not just the ones who understand automation, uh, but the varied demographic of the Indian context and how it affects each one of us in our daily lives. I'd be happy to share more separately. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, thank you, Indrani. Uh, Professor Rajodhari. <laughs> Oh, your turn, if you can speak a few words. Over there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I thank Bengal Chamber of Commerce for inviting me here. And I stand here because it, I get a feel about the whole uh, audience. And it helps me to speak. And as you know, as economists, we always try to find more problems than solutions and uh, I am not really outside that sort of a training but let me tell you first one thing that the automation or uh, in various forms you can call it artificial intelligence you can call it digital world I mean there are different steps different levels whatever be the case there are two sides to it very clearly the most important thing is, in under whatever circumstance, in whatever way we think about it, the GDP of the nation, the supply of goods and services are going to go up by leaps and bounds. Because transaction cost will be lower, the production apparently will be higher, and I will come to that because there are contradictory data about that. But what will happen to the demand side? Will it match? Because after all, the demand will come from those who earn wages and salaries and profits from this economy. That's the question mark. If not, we can have a situation where supply will outstrip demand and that the automation will create problems which we may not be able to handle very carefully. Coming to that in the same vein, I would say there's a big debate going on in countries where automation has gone uh, maybe uh, uh, ten times more than us, uh, especially the advanced nations. Which kind of jobs will be affected? After all, when there is automation, when you have from a digital world, you are going to robots and going to other kinds of advanced levels of artificial intelligence for that matter, which kinds of jobs will be affected? Surprisingly, and this is done by some of the best economists who are working in this in the United States, they found in advanced countries the low level jobs and the high level jobs are spared. The middle level jobs, which are called the routine jobs, the clerical work, the operatives, the laborers, that's affected most, surprising. Because we think the, uh, it will affect the high skilled workers. Apparently, the data shows it's not. Does it mean the wages are affected likewise? Not necessarily. So the whole question is this routine versus non-routine jobs and it's apparently this is coming to the limelight that when the automation started they affected the routine jobs which does not require cognitive work. 
is basically non-cognitive. When the cognitive work came, apparently people thought that it's a humans which will do it. But increasingly, that domain is intruded by the automation process as well. Good or bad is a different issue. In fact, uh, people give various kinds of examples. When Amazon brought in the robots, they got the robots to move things from here and there. The uh, United States, they bring in the SIVA system in 2000, I guess, uh, uh, 10 or 11, something like that. But still, putting the things in the right shelf and doing this kind of work still left to humans. You have driverless, uh, you know, uh, vehicles. Uh, they have test drive driven in the Pittsburgh and etc. But then, when it comes to a crossing, where you do not have that kind of a thing input, that input is programmed, a traffic jam, a sudden uh, dislocation in the roads, the driverless car cannot work. This is the cognitive part. So people thought those who do the cognitive part, apparently non-routine uh, work, that will be safe, that kind of job will be there. But uh, what will happen in future is to be seen. Now, there is something which the economist has also come about, which is called productivity paradox. We all think that uh, automation is complementary, that when automation comes, it almost inevitably increases the labor productivity. Surprisingly, in the advanced countries, the labor productivity growth has continuously slowed down after the automation process. And the data is disturbing. The Labor productivity growth, which was about 4% in advanced countries in 1980s, fell to something like 2% in 90s to early to the 21st century. Now it has gone to like 0.5%. And those who believe in automation, the projected figures are very rosy. That if you go to something like 2035, the labor productivity will go up maybe by, God knows, 15%, 20%. Right now it has not. And this is termed as productivity paradox. And if there is a productivity paradox, will, uh, can we really say that the GDP growth will accelerate, will really uh, go at a breakneck speed and will have a, almost reaching the millennium? Not sure. These paradoxes are there. Then the other paradox, and we hear about that quite often, very true for India. As you know, 20% of the population has gone beyond class 8. After all, they, are, they have not got the fruit of digital world uh, in the equal proportion as the skilled workers. Those who have crossed this class 8, disproportionate benefit has gone to them. We had made a study of about 7 or 8 Indian cities. And those cities where the income inequality has grown the highest, the fastest, are the cities where the IT has concentrated. Disturbing facts. Because it's all known that the skilled workers, if you have eight skilled workers, you have a one unskilled worker in the IT sector. And the IT sector intrudes now in various types of service sector. Service, 65% of our GDP comes from services, largely getting automated. So what will happen to this unskilled, this huge population who haven't crossed the class 8, I don't know. The US data is disturbing. We hear about reskilling. And when we look at the US data, the reskilling process was quite fast in the 80s, slowed down in the 90s, which was something like 8% of workers were reskilled in the 1980s, fell down to something like 4% in the beginning of 21st century and late 1990s. Now it's 0.5% reskilling, and they are simply scratching their head that reskilling was something which is the backbone of the US economy. What's happening to them? When the automation comes, can we cope up with the reskilling process? If US thinks about that, we must pay attention to this reskilling. The word is easy, the process is not so easy. The whole digital, sorry, the vocational education system in India is detached from reality. I don't have time to go into that, but we can have a one-day seminar of automation and vocational education, how disconnected they are. So reskilling, good word. 
If United States is worried about that, then that worry will be 10 times, 50 times more for us. Uh, I will end with one more thing. In fact, in one seminar, uh, I was with a panelist, or the whole panel, there was a, somebody, very high senior person from State Bank of India, and he was telling us how good the digital world now is, what State Bank has done. Uh, in fact, I, I'm a customer of State Bank, I know nothing against State Bank. They are very user friendly, they are one of the best digital platform in the banking system. But when I asked him, uh, oh, sorry, her, which one should go first, the financial literacy of persons or the digital world? Or will it go simultaneously? And we all know that the financial literacy is an absolute laggard compared to the digital world. So what will happen to uh, this digitalization? Think about this whole population in the rural, semi-urban areas. The banking system is penetrating. The digital world is penetrating. What about the financial literacy? How many studies have done? I'm sorry to say, we are not even very well aware. We get the data from literacy. We know how literacy, that percentage is rising. We are very proud of that, it is. Not as high as the East Asian countries. We are still laggards. But what about the rate of financial literacy? What's the quantitative dimensions? Nobody knows very clearly. And then, the same thing came up, all of us know, in fact this question was raised earlier too, senior citizens are so averse of using cards, credit cards, debit cards and online transactions because the risk averse nature that I will lose whatever money I have saved if I go to online transactions because I, I have read in newspapers that money can be siphoned off, there are so much risk in the online transaction. So what about doing work to get rid of this risk-averse attitude of our senior citizens? And I asked this to the, this, this person, uh, quite a senior person from State Bank, no answer. The only answer is we are making all this information readily available. We are bombarding them every day with SMS, with newspaper advertisements, and cutouts. You ask a senior citizens how many of them have got out of this risk averse mentality and how quickly. If the answer is I go along at the same speed by which all these digital advertisements are done, I will be very happy. Thank you very much. Now, Professor Rai Choudhury, I will just uh, add here a little bit interject. You see that uh